I bet you could put crocodiles in orange juice, in a large pool of orange juice, and they'd be quite happy to swim around in them. It's not going to bother them really at all. So uh, animals that you will find that are going to be affected are, are going to be fish and other microorganisms in here because the water does become quite putrid when you get excesses of, excessive amounts of, of urine and feces in that water. But for the bigger animals that we're looking at, it's not a problem at all. I mean, you can see the elephants are thriving in it. They just covered themselves in the urine and feces infested muddy water. We obviously don't mind the smell too much, but that's not necessarily going to be water that the elephants would prefer to drink. If there's nothing else to drink, then they don't really have a choice. more and more bulls trying to get in on the action is it just me or does it look like there's a little bit more water here than there was yesterday or am i just imagining it is it just because the elephants have been wading through here they'll be creating more waterways i'm sure you saw the elephant on the left was not happy with that egret getting so close so it's kind of swished its trunk in its direction i think i might just be going crazy I think it is just because the elephants have, uh, yeah, just created m these pathways. And that tiny little blackbird that we see fluttering around every now and then, that's a black crake. Between the egret and those little crakes, they're just catching insects that are being disturbed now by the elephants in the grass. You know, little birdies. Whoops. Okay, while these elephants just uh, frolic about in the in the water, let's go across to Tembi and uh, have a look and see what animals are out and about. Oh, I thought we were going to be looking at a Nyala and some elephants, but not today. Tembi Elephant Park is filled with giraffe. A couple of them highlight at the background though too, which is quite a, a nice change of scenery. You can definitely see how this area has had plenty of rain. The water has filled up these water holes quite nicely. How many giraffe have we got? We've got six, six of them for now. There could be more. Looks like quite, oh there we go. There's a seventh one. Quite a big bull just off on the right hand side and then I think the rest are a mixture of females
Oh, this is going to be great. We, we're so lucky. We always see giraffe drinking when we are visiting the Oldonio camera in Kenya. It'll be nice to have a change of scenery. I think we'll get some beautiful reflections. It doesn't look like there's much wind today. And one of the giraffe bulls is quite interested in this female. You can see how he's rubbing his head up against her, kind of keeping quite close by, standing right up behind her. She doesn't seem to be too interested right now, but, you know, the courtship process can take a little bit of time. Especially if there are other uh, male giraffe in the area, and there is a female that's coming to East Just, they're all going to try and compete for her. But uh, nothing serious as of yet, but we'll just keep an eye on it. Jungle Jim, you said it's always odd seeing more than one giraffe at a time. But yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you exactly how many giraffe I've seen in one place but in in Kenya specifically you get some unbelievable sightings of like you know 30 or 40 giraffe all standing together and at Karicha Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa too they've got plenty of giraffe there so you get some spectacular sightings big journeys of them which is really nice then I see that the uh, Jive Bunny, you said that you believe that there's a golf course somewhere in South Africa where the giraffe roam. Well, there's a, a really famous golf course uh, in basically in the Kruger National Park. It's near the Skakuza Rest Camp. It's called Skakuza Golf Course. And there are no fences. It's completely open to the Greater Kruger. So you can see lions on the fairway. You might even have a pack of wild dogs, kill an impala right on the green. Uh, all sorts of things so you'll definitely see giraffe and um, plenty more animals too I've never played on that golf course before but I'd love to it's on a, a like a bucket list of mine so for those of you wanting to come on a safari holiday and perhaps you are keen on golf bring those golf clubs along and uh, and try and book yourself uh, in I mean imagine teeing off with just you know being surrounded by wildlife kind of checking a couple of bucket lists uh, destinations off in one go and then cherry you've said is urine the only way for male giraffe to know if a female is ready to mate and um, it's going to be the most accurate way but think about how well developed the senses are of animals in comparison to us as humans so they're also giving off a lot of pheromones and when those cows are coming into estrus um you know they're going to be able to to pick that up i'm sure um in the air too but of course by testing the urine directly and passing uh, that urine over the vomeronasal organ the jacobson organ and that's really going to tell them um but it looked you know this male's starting to get more and more keen and he's constantly stretching down uh, towards the rear end, so perhaps she is an estrus. You can see he's being a little bit, little bit more determined now. There seems to be a female though that's saying to him, hey, get out of here, which is quite interesting. Do you see that? Are you rubbing your head against him or are you actively trying to push him away? That's quite interesting behavior. So there's definitely a female on the left. Oh, she, are you walking away now? Let's see if she's going to continue butting her head against that male. It's not something that we typically see. We normally see the, uh, the males fighting with one another to compete for females. No, she's moving off now. And you can see that there's a, another male giraffe just off to the right. So he doesn't seem to be too interested in that female. They all keep kind of going up to him and bashing him with their heads before moving off. You can see him, he's trying to entice the female by 
kind of rubbing up against her. He looked like he wanted to try and mount her. Well, it's not an easy process for the males to be able to mount the females, especially if they don't stand still. They're awkward enough as is. There you go, just watching how he stepped out, encouraging the other male giraffe to kind of just keep on, you know, moving. Perhaps they've already sorted out their differences before uh, before we got to see them. Donald, you're wondering when predators hunt giraffes, do they usually target the younger ones? Uh, well, a younger giraffe is going to be much easier to take down. Um, so, yes, however, predators will also hunt fully grown giraffe too. So, uh, prides of lions, uh, I mean, there's one national park called Ruaha National Park in Tanzania, and it holds 10% of Africa's lion population and I have spoken about this before but when I was there about two years ago it was unbelievable to see every time we found a pride of lions they were on a giraffe kill so the giraffe um, the lions in that area have specialized in catching giraffe it's quite a technique and there's a couple of other smaller uh, game reserves in the area where I am from there's one called Makalali uh, it's about a 45 minute drive from Hootsbrake the pride of lions there also have specialized in hunting giraffe um, so, so yeah, so it just takes a little bit of practice and once they've kind of got that down, then why would you not want to try and catch a giraffe? It's a huge meal. It's going to last you many days and I suppose that's the goal for lions, right? That if they don't have to hunt every single day but could rather catch something that's bigger, why not do that?
because we could spend all day watching the giraffe and uh, see how this all unfolds but it doesn't look like they're going to be moving off anytime soon but quite interesting to just see so many giraffe males and females all interacting around one another and this is actually typical behavior of, of giraffe they it's no longer considered that they have a, a social structure that we refer to as temporary associations uh, for those of you if you are guides and you are watching or budding nature enthusiasts you've got to help me uh, and uh, we have to stop uh, kind of talking about temporary associations now and move forward and what I would recommend doing is just doing a bit of research for yourself you'll see that the the most recent uh, research that has come out after years and years of studying they all talk about giraffes actually having a matriarchal uh, system which is really interesting and the same thing goes with the males they really uh, uh, interact with one another they're not as unsocial as we think but in the meantime we'll let the giraffe try and uh, get on with their business behind the tree let's go do a bit of birding at Rosie's pan Not much to see at first glance, but if we look down to the rock that's just in the water on the right hand side, I can already see one bird waiting patiently. It's probably a starling, I think, but we'll have a closer look. Um, but as you know, with Rosie's pan, anything can happen. We could get a nice big kudu bull coming down to have a drink. Maybe an elephant comes on by. Who knows? Sometimes I wish that that rock was just a little bit further to the left so we could see what's happening in the shallows because now this bird is making it very difficult for us to ID it. Looks like it's having a great time though, you can see it splashing around, having a bath. Oh, look at the terrapin on the left on the rock. Did you see it just balancing there perfectly? There we go. Terrapins are just phenomenal creatures because they don't look like they're able to climb very well. But um, I don't think it would have been too much effort for this terrapin to navigate its way all the way up onto the top of the rock. And it's a nice change of scenery too. I've yet to see a terrapin sitting on this particular rock with a perfect place to sunbathe. Now it's very difficult to tell if it's a marsh or a serrated hinged terrapin, which are the two species we typically see in the low felt. Um, we need to pay close attention to some finer details. Uh, but yeah it's it's really really tricky it's not the easiest thing to do Don't 
Donald, you're wondering how do turtles excrete uh, waste? Uh, well, they they still can they still defecate. Um, so they've got an, an anal opening, which is where the feces would then be passed on to. Uh, what's really interesting with terrapins, though, is this is, is not so much a waste product, but more of a defense mechanism. They've got these little stink glands on the sides of their shells, and they secrete this horrific substance. It's quite oily. It's not very nice at all. I can't even describe the smell to you, but you can never get it off uh, once it's on your hands. But they'll typically only do that if you try and pick them up. But yeah, otherwise, they just dispose of waste like most animals would. I can't say I've ever seen terrapin feces before, but I have seen tortoise feces, and it is surprisingly large. Obviously, it depends on the size of the individual, but uh, it, it's bigger than you think it is. See, I'm looking at the this terrapin's head now, but I still can't see the detail that I'm looking for to be able to tell if it's a marsh or a serrated hinge terrapin. I love the way that their heads are always tilted up. And it's a pity you might be able to see how long their claws are as well. If we could get another terrapin to come here and climb up on top of this one, that would be great. It's always quite something special to see. The most terrapins I've ever seen stacked on top of one another was about four of them. And Tom, you said just looking at this terrapin is making your neck sore. I know. I was also just thinking the same thing. Imagine having to sit like that. But I suppose that they're used to it. And now we're just waiting patiently for some birds to come back around. And Deshaun, you're wondering what do those terrapins eat? They eat a couple of different things. They'll eat insects. They're kind of like omnivores, really. So whatever is available. Um, but um, if there are lots of insects and things and then aquatic plant vegetation, that's pretty much what they're going to go and uh, a feed on. I don't see any of the little birds bouncing around from tree to tree just yet. And Ramon, you've asked if there are any lions around. Not that I've seen just yet. I know everybody's chatting away on the YouTube uh, chat about, about all the lion activity on Juma over the last couple of days. But I haven't seen anything around here yet. Uh, but I have a feeling that as we go into winter, these water holes are going to become quite popular for the predators. So something to look forward to, but we'll keep an eye out. It's not to say that there isn't a lion or a leopard lying in the shade of these trees. I mean, you can just see how thick the vegetation is. It'll be impossible to, to see anything. And also it's a nice cool day. So something still could come down and have a drink. But we'll just scan around the water's edge now and uh, keep an eye out and see if we can see anything.
Oh, it doesn't seem like we're having too much luck. There are a couple of birds, most of them being blue waxbills and some starlings. So we'll come back here when it warms up a bit. But let's go and check out some more birds at Old Daniel. This is a lovely lush change of scenery. We've got helmeted guinea fowl just moving along the water edge. You can see there's lots of dung just on the other side of the water hole, which is great. So maybe we'll get those guinea fowl kicking some of it open, exposing all sorts of insects, maybe even a couple of seeds. Not a big group of them, just two. And they're slowly going to move off now out of sight. A couple of little birds flying around, I'm trying to just see what they are. Just here on this, this left hand corner of the dam, you see there's a bird with it's got some black and white on it. Who are you? Hopefully the camera will zoom in now. There is quite a delay. Black and white, it's got quite a long tail. Now it's just going off to the left again. Come on, pop your head up. Might have been a pintail wider. It did look like it had a long tail, but it's, I don't know if it's flown off or if it's just hiding behind there. But there is an emerald spotted wood dove. It was just calling. You can see it just on the bottom left hand corner of the screen. Hello, beautiful bird. And doves often go unnoticed, which is quite sad. But these are one of the prettier doves and one of the smallest species that we see. And so, guys, we'll just kind of follow it and then see what it gets up to. Oh, there we go. It is a pintailed wider. There's the bird that I was talking about. Now I can get a much better view. So that's a male. Um, and there were actually two species of widers flying around. Some of you might remember the uh, straw-tailed wider. Uh, so it looks fairly similar to the pin-tailed wider. But one of the biggest differences is that its tail is not long and black, but more of a straw, like a yellowish color. Oh my goodness, and it looks like there's plenty of insects on top of the water. Do you see that? I don't know it, who they are, if they're boatmen, if they're whirly beetles, water striders. Gosh, it could be a number of different things just uh, moving along the surface of the water. But I just noticed, or pond skimmers, there's more than, more than I've, you know, you normally see. It might be difficult to identify them, but one of the little aquatic creatures. You can see how fast they move. They also look like they're playing bumper cars and bouncing into one another. We're going to head up and have a look at some of the trees now, just see if we can find some more birds.
And it's our friend, the unstriped ground squirrel. Hello. What you doing? Just surveying. It's a lovely spot for a squirrel to live in amongst uh, all these branches. And I'm sure you can tell that this is a, a male. I don't think I really need to point out why I think it is a male. He's kind of sitting, sniffing the air. You can see that nose is working overtime. I'm surprised you aren't out foraging, looking for something to eat. But maybe with there being so much, just lots of vegetation around at the moment, it's not necessary to venture too far away from home. There we go, having a nibble on a plant. I'm getting lost in the vegetation. A great hiding place too. Hopefully you don't have to stress too much about aerial predators if you've got lots of cover like that squirrel does. But this is the tree that we were going to be heading to. And it looks like the straw-tailed wider that I was telling you about earlier. That's what uh, bird is sitting there. And you can see the tail's nowhere near as beautiful as the pin-tailed wider. Let me hear it calling. very quiet today. So he's just sitting up there hoping to attract some females, although sitting very still like that and maybe not showcasing your beautiful tail is not going to earn you any girls. Cherry, you've asked, well, you've said, isn't it weird that all these different wider species hang around in the same spot? You thought that they would avoid one another. Well, they're not in co uh, direct competition with one another, if that makes sense, at, for females specifically. So it's the reason why they'll be hanging around in a similar space is because it's it's like the preferred habitat. Um, I mean, why does notoriously like areas where there's lots of grass around? They, they, uh, they do predominantly feed on seeds. So one habitat can, of course, accompany a variety of, of birds. And like I said, the pintailed wider that there is not going to be going after the straw-tailed female widers. So with there being water about two, it's a common place. So it will typically bring animals together. So that could be another reason why we're seeing so many different species all at once. There's food and water. But you can hear that straw-tailed wider. He's singing his heart out. Desperately trying to entice any females. But I haven't seen any of any flocks flying towards him. 
There's another bird in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, literally right at the bottom, just sitting tucked away. It's very camouflaged. We'll see if we can get a better view of it. a bit difficult to find the focus when I look at it I think of a shrike but it's tricky to tell so it's got a black eye mask which I'm sure you could you can see it looks like it's got a slightly reddish head I almost want to say maybe it's something like a red tailed shrike
At least we've got the impala that are making their way down now to the water's edge. It'll be a good opportunity to have a look. Uh, hopefully there's a, a big ram here. One of the things I absolutely love about impala in East Africa is just how big their horns are. But we'll wait and see if we get lucky and then I'll chat a bit more about that. But for the most part, it's just the females with their youngsters. All got their heads down, feeding on all the delicious grass and plants right at the back. And you can constantly see tails wiggling and how they twitch their coats. Just to try and alleviate some of those biting flies. You can just see how annoyed they're getting, kicking their legs, shaking their heads, flicking their ears. Imagine spending your entire life doing that all the time. It would drive me insane. That would very much put me in an asylum. That's a great close-up of the impalas now, too. We're so close to them, we might even be able to see some louse flies. bumping heads. So louse flies are really interesting creatures and I wonder how many of these, you see these big black dots that the impalas have on them. Some of them are going to be flies. It's, it's difficult to tell though but louse flies are almost like these laterally compressed horse flies if you will but they've, they are scary and, and I, I don't even think I can do them justice in, in, in terms of accurately describing them so you'll have to google a picture. But they've got these strange legs, but they're so powerful, they're able to hold on uh, to the animals. So when they shake, they really don't go anywhere at all. And if you've ever been to Kenya or Tanzania, and you spend some time with the Pride of Lions, you most certainly would have seen louse flies. We see them every now and then in South Africa, but not nearly to the extent that you see them in East Africa. Tara, you've asked, what is the black patch on the impala's foreheads? Um, so, just a slight, I don't know, color differentiation. However, they do have a scent gland on the top of their heads. And you've probably noticed impala rams you know, sometimes rubbing their heads up on, on vegetation. Um, obviously it's nice to have a bit of a scratch and sometimes they'll rasp their horns on trees just to kind of show how big and strong they are. 
but they also will secrete this very mild sort of substance. Um, that, and that secretion will then go onto the plant and it can be one of the ways that they'll use to advertise, you know, that a, a territory, this particular space is taken. The birds are very chirpy today. But as some of you know, we occasionally have got clips that have happened during the week, some really interesting things. Oh, look, Mount Kilimanjaro is poking its head out. That's been ages since I last saw a beautiful big mountain at the back. Um, but what we're going to do now is we are going to go and watch uh, a clip about a crocodile and a hippo. <laughs> So there's a little hippopotamus dashing through the shallows, oh, entering some slightly deeper water. Oh my goodness, but it looks like there's a crocodile on the left, beelining straight towards that little hippo. Oh, you better, you better go quick. You better go quick. You can see how quickly that crocodile's moving with absolute ease, not even creating a wave. Okay, now this now this hippo has turned to face the crocodile. Let's see what happens. Uh, there we go. Little one made it to mom. Now that croc oh, there's two crocodiles actually coming closer. Oh, you can see there's another croc on the right. Our mom's not going to take too kindly to the crocs at all. And there's typically an unwritten rule between the two species: you leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. So quite daunting for that uh, mother hippopotamus just being there on her own. It might be that that calf is just that young that she's kind of just separated from the rest of them. Or she could have been out grazing and has made her way down to the water's edge. But uh, sure, lucky hippo calf. And here we are. This is beautiful Mount Kilimanjaro that we can see. You can see it's uh, layered with snow up on the top. And I can't, it's been months since I last had a glimpse of it, as it's rainy season. Kenya has obviously had a lot of rain, but isn't that spectacular? It almost doesn't look real. So Africa's largest mountain. Has anybody that's watching climbed Kilimanjaro before? Does anybody want to climb it? It's not really something that I'm wanting to do, to be quite honest. I don't know if I want to climb the mountain. It's still really beautiful to see.
And just like that, Kilimanjaro is being engulfed by the clouds once again. Come on, wildlife, where is everything today? Right, we're going to wait for the wildlife to all come back. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to go back to Tau because it looks like the crocodile, or at least one of them, is moving around. You can see the crocs. Looks like one was emerging from the mud just about. Maybe trying to find a comfy spot. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll get some more action. We've been moving around and hunting like they were yesterday. This heron is also fixated on something. Gus still it is standing. It might be slowly leveraging forward. If it wasn't for the yellow billed stork moving around, it would once again look like everything is frozen. Come on, yellow billed stork, come feed this side, next to the heron, amongst the crocodiles. Now, heron's getting out of there. Gonna maybe go try a different fishing spot. Let's follow the heron, seeing as though the crocodiles are making it a bit difficult for us to see what's actually going on. There's the egret taking the place now of the heron.
I don't think they'd hear in like the egret stealing its spot. <laughs> but you snooze, you lose. So there we go, there's a good example of competing for space. The heron won that one, sending the egret on its way. Although I don't know why they have to fight for feeding grounds. There's plenty of spots open here to do a bit of fishing or frogging. Moonbeam Smith, you've said with all the predators around, uh, how could there be any fish left? Oh, there'll be plenty of fish and these birds are not just hunting fish. They also will feed on insects and frogs. So uh, there's most likely going to be a lot of catfish or barbel that'll be swimming around. Yesterday we had some sightings where a few of the birds did catch fish. Nothing too spectacular. Um, but the amazing adaption that the barbel has, or the catfish has, to be able to cope with the drying up uh, pools of water is that they can encase themselves in a mucous membrane and, and, and stay alive basically for a couple of years, even if they're just in dried up mud. And then they'll return and, and can, I, can I say rehydrate? Uh, once the once the pools filled with water again so and really just depends but they'll also like I said there'll be so many different frog species here too and then Sandy Franklin you've just joined hello hello welcome so now you can see this heron it's moved away from the water's edge so it's probably going for something like a frog but you know any of this yellow billed stalk that we're looking at this heron they'll literally eat anything i've seen herons eating small mammals uh, so if there's a rodent even if there's a snake they'll de all try and grab those things they're not going to turn uh, their beaks up to it at all
Oh, there we go. Change of scenery. What we've all been waiting for. A rather large herd of elephants just strolling across the bare plains. Now, come on, make your way to have a drink. I don't seem to be in any rush as it's not that hot today. But you can see there's just so many more elephants just gathering along the tree line. They may have already had a drink on the far left-hand corner, which is the preferred side. This is where they would typically come to have a mud wallow. Let's see if they change direction. Fingers crossed. Looks like they might maybe just on the other side of this tree make their way down. Mac 23 GLS, you said that's a fantastic large herd of elephants. It is. It really is. Come on, girls, bring the youngsters here. There we go. This this cow in front, she looks like she's quite excited to, to get down and dirty. A nice little pool. There's a couple more bird species. Don't tell me, elephant, you've just rushed all the way there to now turn and leave. No, just trying to find an easier way to access that muddy water. The wildebeest also wanting in on the action. It's just really great to see elephants of the different ages. Lots of young ones too. There's a black wing stilts also moving around. And a couple of other little birds that I can't tell you what they are. Egyptian geese, another yellow billed stork. Maybe those are spoon bills. Our little elephant, be careful of how deep that mud's going to get. Don't be tempted. That's my problem. Whenever there's mud around, I can't help myself. Oh, a young one charging on in. This is where these young elephants are going to learn valuable lessons about how sticky mud can be. But luckily it seems to be quite hard on the area that they're walking. The wildebeest now quickly trying to get around, also stirring up the water thick knees in the process. And it looks like one crocodile just lying in the shallows too. Let's see if the croc's going to pop under the water and maybe move towards the wildebeest. But for now, it's sitting very still. Everybody and I say everybody, all the animals are completely oblivious to that croc for the meantime. Whoops, whoops. A little bit deeper than they thought.
That doesn't seem like that crocodile is going to make a move. They'll be just content. I think unless when the wildebeest falls on top of it, maybe it will make a move. Sandy Franklin, you said that you just love these baby Ellie's. Me too. This is always fun to watch. It's great to have them keeping us entertained. And then everybody's just kind of doing their own thing. And just like that off everybody goes okay we're gonna head off to Olifant's uh, river now and uh, and see what's happening there there we go always good to hear the sound of the, the river running quite quickly Quite a few elephants coming down to have a drink. It just looks like bulls making their way down. We haven't seen any females and youngsters just yet. But also after the muddy water, not coming to have a drink just yet. We'll see. Be nice if they do swim out into the across the river, maybe to one of the islands. Always fun to watch. I see there's a comment on the YouTube chat from Justin Wright and you said you have asked if I've seen the footage of the elephant picking up the truck recently I, I there's well there's been two sightings recently of elephants um, encountering vehicles in a negative fashion I think the one that you're maybe talking about is the one that happened in Pilansburg um, you know what it's so difficult to tell 
I mean, you know what I'm like, I'm very opinionated and I'm the first one to have to have something to say. But I just found that there just there wasn't enough evidence to really be able to see what happened. Um, I mean, it looks like they're at some kind of a rest camp. I don't know if they drove around the corner and they bumped into this big elephant and that's when the situation kind of occurred. I know there's two separate uh, bits of footage, one from inside the vehicle and then another uh, bit of footage from uh, people looking um, you know, towards the scene and they looked like they were on foot which makes me think that it was a rest camp of some kind. I'm not sure, you know, and the thing is is that when, when you do have a negative encounter with elephants um, we do shout, we do bang the side of the car, sometimes people will hoot, sometimes you start your car, you rev the engine and in severe cases people do actually drive forward as a, as a way to try and discourage an animal from charging you. So I don't really know, but that elephant looked like he had, you know, he was kind of set in his ways and, and, and he was going to hit the car regardless. So I can't really comment, I can't say that it was typically bad guiding, there's just not enough evidence there. Um, because if I was in that position, right, and an elephant was hitting the vehicle, if I somehow got myself into a situation like that, best believe I'd also be shouting and uh, trying everything that I can uh, to deter the elephant. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a really tricky thing. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I've never been in a situation like that, and I hope to never ever be in a situation like that. But there is another video that's sadly gone round in sight in recently from Kufuri National Park in Zambia, where an elephant also was seen running miles away chasing this vehicle, and then the vehicle stops. I'm not sure why the vehicle stopped. I probably would have carried on going because that elephant meant business. You could see it was just pushing over trees. And I do believe that one person unfortunately died, which is very sad. So you always have to have your wits about you when interacting with elephants because the situation can change very quickly, like literally in the blink of an eye. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's sometimes it's really difficult to comment on what actually happened. Um, but you can, I suppose we don't have to dwell on the negatives. You can see that elephant right at the back on the left almost looks like it has a hump on top of between its head and its uh, shoulder blades uh, it looks like it's got a collar and the elephants in the greater Kruger area uh, especially around Olifant then into Baluli into Pridelands into Klaseri, Timbavati all these different areas that all connect to one another there are lots of elephants that are uh, um, that are collared so I'm not sure who would have collared them if it is elephants alive but the data that they're able to get you know tracking the movements of these animals do they move seasonally do they only move huge distances when they're in mass And there's some amazing work that's being done at the moment on tracking collars for animals because an elephant collar is really heavy in comparison to, to how big an elephant is it probably doesn't bother them too much but um, I know there's some organizations that are trying to reduce the size of, of the collars to make them less invasive but one of the biggest problems is the battery you, know, you need a battery that's long lasting that you don't need to change every single year because that's quite invasive to have to drive an animal all the time i know there's, there's big projects and, and some great technology that's really going to pioneer and change the way in which tracking devices uh, are i suppose the, the size and the weight of them which is exciting elephant on the right just sticking his tusk into the ground looks like he's wanting to have a, a roll around but it might be a bit tricky with so many elephants all in the same spot
a little bit of change of scenery with the giraffe. Seems as though the day is filled with giraffe and elephant. This is just one female feeding just against the tree line. I don't see any more at the moment, but there could be some spread out, so maybe moved on already. And it's looking quite lush along the Olifants River. You can see a little bit of greenery uh, on the short grass. That's just from the bits of rain that we have had. But I don't think it will stay green for too long, actually. Speaking of, let's check the weather. Oh, there we go. There's another giraffe. That makes more sense. Oh, no. Here they all come. So they met. Oh, wow. Ah, oh, typical. So <laughs> it looks like we're going to have some big rain next week, which is great. Because I'm going on safari on Saturday. So that's perfect. So we'll get soaked. Wonderful. Can't wait. We have to take my poncho with this time around. Soaking soggy safaris. I suppose I haven't had one of those in a while. Might as well get exposed to all the elements. The last safari I was on, uh, we had uh, dust storms, which was great. I suppose we can change it up a little bit. I'm just having another little scan around. Hello, Gerard. Oh, also being chased by a male. <laughs> that seems to be the theme of the day. Off we go, girl. I'm again not interested in the male, you can see. Ears flat back. So she, that's a way to tell the kind of mood that she's in. But she actually looks like she might be pregnant. It's rather round or, uh, around the midsection. Do you see that? But she's bulging a bit. She's going to get a big kick to the face. She's clearly not impressed or interested in, in him in any way. Yeah, she's definitely pregnant. Look at that. So it could just be that she's giving off some, uh, you know, a whole bunch of hormones and he is misinterpreting them. Jenny, you, you've asked, what is the purpose of horns in female animals? Uh, so with, with giraffe, it's, you know, just kind of part of their anatomy so much because for the most part, the, 
the thing that protects a giraffe, whether you're a male or female, is your powerful kick. Those legs are super important. Of course, we know males will use those little ossy cones, so they're not horns in the traditional sense, um, but it's fused bone to the skull, um, and it doesn't have a keratin coating like a horn would. So slightly different. But so it's interesting. I, I still think that the studies are inconclusive. Um, these are of course just theories, but one of the theories is, is that a female animal, or let's go with antelope, for example, that have horns, are, they need it because they live out in the, the open. So, you know, it's one thing having a male that will be around to try and protect the members of his herd, but females will still need to protect their offspring too. So, look at something like wildebeest, they typically live out in big open areas, uh, we look at springbuck for an example. I mean, there's a whole host of different animals and typically those animals and those female animals are living in big wide open spaces. Um, so, and then some of the other antelope species that live in denser vegetation, uh, they will use a different tactic, you know, anti-predatory defense. Uh, they might hide away rather. And then there's no real need for them to have horns. But again, it's, it, it doesn't explain it very well. Um, these are just some suggestions. And again, as I always say, perhaps as technology advances, maybe there'll be a way for us to be able to understand animals a little bit better and we'll get some more conclusive answers. But in some species of animals, you actually start to see the horns um, becoming redundant. And the best example of that is in East Africa and of the Thompson's gazelle. You'll see the females and you will be able to Google and look at pictures or if you happen to be going on a trip to East Africa where you could potentially see Thompson's gazelles, you'll notice that the females' horns are brittle. They're like toothpicks um, and some of them broken off. Some of them might only have one, um, but are, you know, over, over time they just they don't really serve a purpose anymore. So it's almost like evolutionary leftovers and perhaps in hundreds of thousands of years time uh, th you know the Thompson's gazelle the females won't have any horns at all but it looks like it's going that way
how it was nice to watch the giraffe if only some other animals could have snuck out of the bushes for us to see i wouldn't have minded uh, spending some time with the troop of baboons but maybe we'll get that tomorrow what would you prefer yellow baboons at old donia or chocolate baboons along the elephants river or maybe even a tumor ah and typical here go the elephants across the Olifants River. If only you had done this a little uh, while ago, because we've only got a few more minutes of the show just left. And look at them, they're all going to funnel one after the other and uh, probably, like I said, head to some of the islands where there's also nice grazing. But not without having a, a drink first. It's not too deep at all. The water is quite shallow. But that will probably change if we get the rain that is forecasted for next week. We might see the, the Olifants River turn into a raging torrent and the banks exceed where all the uh, sycamore figs are, these big trees in the background. Isn't this fantastic? What a great way to end the afternoon. But I hope you all enjoyed another day of live at the waterhole. I'll see you all tomorrow. Until then, enjoy the sunset safari. Good afternoon, good afternoon, hello everybody, happy Wednesday, welcome to Juma Private Game Reserves and welcome here to the tent. My name is Steve, I'm joined by Ghat over there and this is On Safari. Hello everybody and good afternoon. My name is Steve. As I said before, we are on the On Safari show and here we showcase the highlights over the last 24 hours. Although these highlights are not over the last 24 hours, they're over the last few days. I think from the 31st and from this morning. So basically what we're going to be doing is looking at a few of the cool things that Cedric and myself have seen. Although it seems like today's highlights are exclusively setters. And maybe that's because he's going on leave tomorrow morning. So I'm sure he's very excited about that. So this afternoon, we're showcasing a little bit of 